thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. And thanks for you guys for your time um, to listen to me yak on about these things that we do. Um, I just wanted to, before we kind of uh, crack on with the, the actual presentation proper, I wanted to ask, does anyone know who this is? You grateful Dead. Captain. You said Grateful Dead. You got it, yeah. This is a band called The Grateful Dead. And <clears throat> I think uh, just in terms of, it's, it's, there's a little bit of context to, uh, that links this, this band to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the Grateful Dead uh, is a rock and roll band that started in 1965. They founded a group of, I think, five musicians. Uh, we were very passionate about the instruments and so on. And they started on a very really long journey together. And um, they happened to be the most successful live band in rock and roll history. Um, I didn't actually know this until quite recently. Um, so I started to, when I heard that, I was like, okay, well, how did these guys, how did these guys accumulate that amount of success? And how can they say that they're the most successful live band in rock and roll history? They happen to have played over 2,300 shows uh, to approximately 40 million people over the span of their, their career, uh, which ended in 1995. Their lead singer is a guy called Jerry Garcia. Um, I don't know, has anyone heard of Jerry Garcia? Yeah. There's actually an ice cream named after him called Cherry Garcia. Um, but he, he happens to have smoked more weed, snorted more cocaine, ingested more hallucinogenics and injected more here than any other musician in history. And, uh, well, maybe, except for Keith Richards. Oh, my gosh. Jesus. And I see my sports probably that way as well. Um, but this is the part that interested me. And, and something that, I mean, I've, I've, in the past sort of 16 months or so, been doing a heck of a lot of research <coughs> on what I'm really here to talk about, which is uh, community building, community management, is, is pretty much what, uh, what I do. Um, the Grateful Dead have this community of fans called the Deadheads. And these are guys, they're a little bit crazy. Um, they kind of have this dress code, they wear uh, tie-dye shirts, they, they ingest a crap load of acid. They smoke a whole lot of weed. They all know each other, even though there's a huge community of them. Um, and they've pretty much got their own language that they, they use when they talk to each other. Um, they all know the songs. I, I, to be quite honest, I don't really know Grateful Dead's music very well. Only recently I've started to listen to some of the stuff just purely because this is the kind of stuff that I've been researching lately. And it's pretty cool. It's got a little bit of a, a sort of bluesy, jazzy, improvisational kind of vibe to it which I think if that's your thing is pretty good. I mean, these are good musicians. But these guys go crazy. They hear a dead song, a Grateful Dead song, and they go absolutely <coughs> nuts. It triggers something in them. They start to, they see another dead head. They start to like, like check each other out. And they, you know, start moving. And there's something that really kind of, there's a, there's a visceral emotive response to the Grateful Dead's music. That it evokes in these guys called calling themselves the Deadheads. Um, they also happen to follow the band around, or they did when the band was still around. They um, would sell things like package tours so that you could actually see the band say 10 times in a row over the space of two weeks. So, like, think of going to see like Jack Harrow 10 times in a row. Your ears would start to bleed because it's just horrible. And I think, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the point of it, with these guys is they just kept, they couldn't get enough. They really, really wanted more and more and more. Um, so, The Grateful Dead uh, is an amazing example of uh, a sort of brand, if you will, that, um, uh, that has managed to successfully build a community um, around that particular brand. So what I'm here to talk about um, is creating digital communities. Um, just to give you a bit of context, uh, my agency is Worldwide Creative. I'm the CEO. I also happen to be the creative director, and um, it's a bit of it's a small agency, as you can imagine. Uh, there's only 20 of us, and we've been working with some pretty cool brands over the past couple of years. Uh, particularly now, in the past two years, we've naturally evolved into what we call a, a community-focused agency. We specialize in using the uh, 
the, the social media tools. So, you know, all the things like Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of thing. And, um, and, and it's, it's all about building community for, for our clients. We've started to realize as we're doing it, it almost happened by default because we really enjoyed the whole social media side of things. Um, that, uh, that, you know, community was such an important part of not just the success of our clients, but also marketing in general. And this is a particular thing that, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the whole sort of the presentation and put forward the argument to you, and I'd have some feedback as well in terms of what you think. But I personally believe that community is going to be the most important part of marketing moving forward. If it hasn't been in the past anyway, I think if you think of some brands <coughs> that really stick out in the mind, like Apple or Harley Davidson and so on, they figured that out a long time ago. But it's becoming more and more important as uh, as the sort of environment is evolving in the way that it is currently. So I've called this the, the, this presentation for a better term, creating digital communities. Um, or alternatively, what a 60s rock and roll band can teach us about marketing. So, this is not a social media presentation because I'm sure you guys have all heard social media presentation. I'm sure Chris has bored you to tears about the attention economy and all those kind of those words that are. Sorry, Chris, I'm picking you. But you know, you got it. So, um, but there's a lot of those words and, and that kind of stuff that's sort of floating around the, the marketing environment at the moment. And, you know, I think we've heard, we've heard it all before and also there's a lot of like sort of young cocky punks that are coming in front of us and telling us all stuff that's, you know, it might, it might, uh, it, it kind of latches onto the those words. <laughs> so I think more importantly this is a, a, a presentation about building a community and, and you know it just so happens that the environment um, with all these new beautiful tools that are at our disposal is really kind of playing into the hands of those that want to build communities around their brands. And so, just roll up some paper. If I say anything like, you know, join the conversation, or whatever, just throw it, throw it at me, please. Um, so let's just look. I want to highlight some of the problems because we're always talking about problems, and as marketing people, you always look at the problem first, and you know, look for the solutions and so on. And I think it's really key in terms of providing relevant solutions, that we understand these problems correctly um, that we face. And I think the first one is an obvious one. The noise that we are subjected to is just absolutely mind-boggling at the moment. I worked over the, the holidays, I don't know, did you guys all have a holiday in December? Okay, well I didn't. <laughs> just going to lay that on there because it's bugging me a bit. But I worked, I basically manned the fort at World Art Creative uh, for Cape Town with a couple of the one of my guys in Johannesburg and someone had landed and we were working the whole way through and I booked a holiday over that time in Anglia because I thought screw this like everyone else is on holiday I actually booked a holiday uh, in the mountains where there's a, the two considerations no mobile signal and no internet uh, availability whatsoever and the reason being is because you know I've got this like OCD obsession of my email whenever I get to my email I just want to clear it I want to zero my inbox and every time it's like, you know, you switch it off, then 20 minutes later, you've got 20 new emails all like barking for attention. And it's it's just a crazy environment that we're in. So, I mean, this sweaty looking guy here, <coughs> Schmidt, he's the, uh, now actually, first of all, the ex CEO of Google. Um, and that's quite an amazing stat. The, the second problem, I think, <coughs> is, I think, quite a compelling one that, in general, uh, the management, the marketing, the business owners, entrepreneurs, the people who are driving all these marketing campaigns, a lot of them are really confused about the state of marketing. And, and rightly so, because there's so much happening, there's so much at disposal. There's so many young cocky punks all saying, no, you've got to do blogging to mobile as the thing, or augmented reality, or whatever it is. So, you know, this guy here, his name is Robert Blair. He's the. Um, the uh, global CEO of, uh, or the CEO of Global, Gucci Global. Um, and I, I was very fortunate enough to meet him uh, a couple of months ago. He was at this uh, entrepreneurship summit. And he stood up in front of uh, a bunch of us and he, he was telling us about um, Gucci's marketing strategy moving forward. And um, this is a guy who basically has hundreds of millions of dollars of ad spend budget at his disposal. Um, and he was, you know, he was talking about the fact that things are changing so rapidly. 
his key point was that he has got 2 million people on his Gucci Facebook page in the United States. So his question was, why do we need traditional advertising? And he was starting to get all excited about this whole social media hype, which, you know, rightfully so, I think there's a lot of stuff you can get excited about. But the truth is, is that um, you can't just discount traditional advertising. There's a real understanding that it's not about the, the medium. It is about those traditional things that still hold true. It's about how we use the medium. And I think that's a, a key problem at the moment. The other problem is that everyone's looking for the new, the next big thing, I and mean, you always hear about you know, everything from semi codes to you know um, augmented reality or in gaming advertising, and you get these breathless clients coming with stars in their eyes, coming in, I want to do a viral campaign or you know whatever it is, and without a real understanding of you know the the how it's actually going to work and all that kind of stuff. So I think the the, the next big thing is always calling, it's always pressing us, it's always looking for attention. And we've got to stick to the basics. And I think, um, you know, the other day I actually had, I had a client saying to me, I want more fruit salad in a design that we were creating for a <laughs> And this was, um, this is for online training. So we, we, we're still struggling with that particular challenge. But um, I think, you know, with, with this whole social media campaign that we're running for him, there was a real un unrealistic expectation in that it's almost like now that we've got social media, we're just going to accelerate everything. And uh, although social media is a huge accelerator, it still holds true the, the traditional things of, you know, what is your message, what is the message you're trying to convey, what is the promise, etc. That, that kind of stuff that you learned in marketing school, hopefully. Problem number five is this we're just being completely swamped with social media campaigns. And everybody's, you know, with an iPad, and tweet this and retweet that and whatnot. And it's just becoming good. I don't know, I mean, last week I saw two new with an iPad campaigns on Facebook. So please, do us all the favor, don't go and like it, because it's just going to add to the hype. Feel the whole, the, the, the noise that's, that's emerging out of that. Um, Behaviors are changing fast. I think this is something we all know, and I mean this is a pretty obvious one. But it's also quite, you know, it's quite stirring when you see it so graphically depicted like that. The fact that, you know, if you compare these little things, I mean, the the, the graphs going down and this massive rise in in internet, obviously from a low base, but it thinks, I mean, behavior is changing fast. Uh, we're spending more time on the internet than on TV. I think it's incredible. Um, and I think we just need to have that in mind when we, we think about these things. Um, okay, so get, getting to the juice of this, what does it mean to create a community? These are uh, Grateful Dead fans, by the way. Um, the word community comes from the Latin word uh, communare, which means to share. And we realizing in World Credit that there's, uh, this, this whole idea of sharing is, is, is really important. Um, and what we've, we've realized is the most uh, pivotal thing or the, the, the most uh, valuable thing that you can share is content. So what we've done in terms of just creating a structure and what we, are, um, what we use in terms of defining the roles and creating a community building campaign, something that we call the community management grid. In every digital marketing campaign, there's always three components. The first is attracting traffic to whatever presence it is, whether it's a Facebook page, a website, or some sort of conversion catchment point. The second is the con conversion of traffic. So, you know, it's either sign up for our newsletter, buy a product, uh, join us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, whatever it is. Um, and the third is loyalty. And this is where, obviously, you know, the community building starts to become interesting. There are three pillars for want of a better word, or we sometimes refer to them as, as verticals. The first is content syndication. So it's absolutely key that information, content in some way, shape, or form is pushed out to your current community or potential community members. So what you've got to do is either create it or find it somewhere and push it. And it's, it's such a vital part of keeping top of mind because if you can add value through content, it, um, it really, and you'll see, I mean, the Grateful Dead were doing it 45 years ago when they first started marketing their brand, they were sending out um, mail shots. And one of the first bands to do it, literally the wives of the band members were writing you know, little letters to their 30,000 or so fans who had signed up at concerts. 
pushing our content about the you know the concerts that were coming up, how to book tickets, how to get to various hard to find places, and so on. So uh, nowadays, obviously, it's a lot easier. We can scale it up by using blogs, you know, video channels, um, Facebook, etc. Um, and okay, so the, obviously that's content. This, the second is then monitoring engage, engagement. If you look at the tools that I mean, one of the most valuable tools that we use is Brands, because I don't know, does everyone know Brands? You guys know what brand size? Um, it's an ORM tool, online reputation management tool, but I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Effectively, what it does is it just finds where conversations are happening for us. And it allows us to identify um, you know, where all of these, these community or potential community members are hanging out. And a, an example, we were working with Honda last year. And um, you know, in, in terms of activating their community, we were really battling in the first couple of months. And we realized that, you know, the kind of, uh, the, the fragmented uh, um, uh, motivations of all the various community members we were looking at was proving to be quite problematic in terms of pulling them to us. So what we did was we used our own tools to go find out where they were. And it was quite an important distinction because all of a sudden we were trying to build a Facebook page and create a little blog and all this kind of stuff it was really hard work and we were battling, we were kind of sinking under the, the weight of trying to push our content. All of a sudden, using brands and our own tools, we realized that there were existing conversations happening already. There were, for example, one particular forum of 100 drivers up in Nelspret that had like 4,000 people all actively communicating with each other and going bananas online. And by the time that we heard about them, within about you know, a month and a half or so of the campaign, we went in there and said, hey, Honda, how's it going? They're like, where have you been? We've been here for a year and a half. We've been having these conversations. And we've emailed you and done all this and whatnot. So where have you been? And so they were really stoked for us to come to them. And we used these, um, these monitoring tools to be able to go and find them. And then obviously starting to <coughs> And the engagement part is obviously really important. Um, the third thing is creative stimulus. And this is where I think it's going to distinguish those people, those brands that are successful. This for me, I think the most important part of a, of a community building campaign is the ability to distinguish yourself creatively from the rest of the pack. As the noise levels increase and as more and more brands try to do this and try and you know, win an iPad competition and, and, and put up all that nonsense that's happening, the, the people, the brands that think creatively about their message, package in a, a compelling, interesting um, and appealing way are the ones that are going to understand that. I mean, you've seen it like with, for example, Apple and Holly Davidson and the brands that are doing it right. Um, and it's a tricky business. I mean, this whole creati creativity can go horribly wrong in some cases as well. So, the holy grail of community marketing, and I think, you know, this is, this is for me uh, the most important uh, lesson that we've had to learn about all of this stuff, is that you know, I mean, Robert Pillay, for example, if you recall that slide of, you know, a few minutes ago, he was saying he's got two million people on his Facebook page that he can go and direct, uh, directly engage with each and every one of them. That's not sustainable, if you think about it. You've got two million people there. And how the hell are you going to try and message each of them, engage and interact with all of them? It just, it's just not going to work. You know, it's going to be far too cost costly to be able to do it right. So, the holy grail of community management and community building, effectively, is when community members start naturally talking to each other. Um, the Grateful Dead have got forums all over the world, in their countries, their regions, um, in the specific towns that they, they live in. And they talk about, you know, the favorite concert they had, like the memorabilia that they want to trade and exchange and all that kind of stuff. These are three examples. This one is for Yappy Chef. Does anyone, does anyone know Yappy Chef? The, the kitchen premium kitchen tools website. They're really mates of, of mine. And they'll do something like this particular thread here on Facebook was in answer to a like I think it was about a six word question about you know how do you like your fish? And it just went on for miles about <laughs> like arbitrary discussions people are having with each other. The second column here is for um, the rugby bloke uh, Kyo. Let's see, it's a, I don't know, I mean, probably some of the guys have been on to Kyo, but it's hilarious. 
They've got their, their own language. They, they all know each other. They talk to each other in the comments. So the writers on Keo will write a two to three paragraph little you know synopsis of the match or whatever. And these guys just kick in in the comments column and they just start going off and they get completely distracted. But then they're not even talking about rugby, they're talking about like some briar that happened two years ago. <laughs> and they start insulting each other, and they're all like, oh, but in, like two weeks ago you said this and whatever. They all know each other and they're friggin' commenting on a blog for crying out loud. So Mark here and the, the rugby journalist who started here, has I think by accident rather than by design, created a community around a singular entity which is rugby. And, um, and he's just got this passionately loyal bunch of people. Um, the sales guy, who was trying to sell us advertising, sent us the most popular sports blog in the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty significant statement to make for a humble little sports blog in the southern tip of Africa. Um, and then this is from the Grateful Dead Facebook page. And you'll notice if you look here, you know, they'll have some uh, like little comments. A little post, and there'll be 425 comments. And again, they're all talking to each other, chatting to each other, and so on and so forth. So they've got this really powerful community that's developed. Um, but again, the key thing is it's them talking to each other. One little comment, which or post, which takes a couple of seconds to write and push out there, literally uh, kicks into this whole process, a cycle of, of events, people talking to each other, and everything, which is sustainable. They just carry on as they were. You have, to have, you have to be pretty ballsy as a brand to be able to do that because obviously you don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes it's kind of, you know, marketing speak like off brand or whatever it may be, and a lot of marketing managers will start to get a little bit anxious and their tummies will um, start getting a bit nervous. But just looking at two, what I find really fascinating um, case studies. Has anyone heard of Rosendale Wine Estate? Did anyone hear about this competition last year? Um, I stumbled upon this when I was looking around at just what people were doing in Facebook and whatnot. And my wife told me about this, which was was a competition, win a romantic spa weekend at Rosendale for two. Rosendale is a tiny, tiny, and I mean tiny, little wine farm out in Robertson. It's run by this guy called Pierre Tellerson, and he's a Norwegian guy. He's got no marketing background or anything. But he thought at the beginning of last year, like, what can I do to just give my marketing campaign a little bit of zip? And I'll bet you that some of you guys have actually entered this competition. Because when I looked at this, I was like, okay, my, my wife was telling me about this. But all of a sudden, I realized that there were 107,000 people that had actually entered this competition. And all of a sudden, I was like, what? Like, we've got clients paying us big cash just for getting like an objective of 30,000 people on their Facebook page. So anyway, I phoned this guy, but I, um, I managed to track down his, his cell phone number. And, uh, and I, I said to him, look, you know, I'm very interested in how you actually did this. I phoned him midway through, through last year. And he just started laughing, saying, like, I don't know. <laughs> All I did was I put up this thing, him and his wife, and his, I think he had some helper. He might, I think it was his niece or something. They started, like, basically um, pushing it out to their friends. Uh, inviting some of their, their mates to this thing, they invited their friends and it just took off from there. So, he, and he was laughing, he had no clue as to what he was doing right. And it was quite a compelling case study for me because, you know, a lot of the stuff that was happening at the same time, like there was a competition by one of the state agents, I can't remember which one it was, Remax. but Remax. Might, no, no, it just, it was, it failed dismally. I mean, it literally, you could hear crickets chirping on the Facebook page, but they had quite a friggin' like significant prize, it was like, you know, it was like two weeks at some massive villa or something. So, you know, and they had like 400 people in this thing and they were pushing some serious like social media agency way behind it. Um, and this guy, some humble Norwegian dude, was getting these kind of results. And anyway, there were subtle nuances, we'll talk about it a little bit later in terms of just things that sort of shone through. Another one, a campaign that we were involved in was, uh, it was a two month little um, burst on Facebook where we put up a, uh, a thing called, um, a competition called Pure Reading Pleasure. It was also just in the run because usually what we were doing for them was just ORM, was pure ORM, but we were also managing the Facebook page. So we suggested it pretty much on the back of the conversation that I had with Pierre Tillerson, the, the Norwegian guy. I suggested to the guys from Exclusives, why don't you just run a little campaign on Facebook? Because there were 2,000 people They've been languishing there for approximately a year and a half. 
since they've been in this thing. So we, we pushed it out to invite all the people in there to start um, telling their friends. The prize was five days where you literally had to remove yourself from the world and sit in a luxury villa in, uh, in uh, Camp Spain and you got as many books as you wanted to read. And so all of a sudden, on the first day, um, we joked that we broke Facebook because literally the, the page went down, they pulled it because there were so many people um, uh, entering the competition. And for some reason, it struck a chord. And so the next step, we, we, we gave away the prize, uh, got to, I think, 30,000 members on, on Facebook, and we started this thing called Flash One Faisal. Did anyone see this thing? Or not last year? It was a Twitter campaign that we ran. And it was, it was basically, you had to be uh, a member, uh, you had to follow exclusives on, on Twitter um, in order to know when the exclusives website was going to have a completely ridiculous um, sale on one of their products. So we bought a, 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 a section of their products. So one week was books, the next was DVDs, the next was um, yes. games, yes. that's right. But it was like books for 10 Rand. So you'd have 10 books for 10 Rand, and you could buy you know, uh, whatever those books were, or games, which are usually 500 Rand for 50 bucks. So the, key, the kind of clincher was that you actually had to be um, a member of, or you had to follow them to know when it was going to happen, because it was going to be a random, a random time. Anyway, it, it was an extremely successful campaign in terms of revenue that was generated by, by the actual uh, the community. Did you create it so you could purchase through Facebook as well? Because I've never seen the. Yeah. <coughs> we know that that's no, you couldn't just a link. Yeah, you, 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 it was a link through to hidden pages on the website. So for a period of two hours uh, every week, the, there would be those pages that were on the website, and then you could go and buy them at whatever price it was. But um, but within one month, because of the community campaign, obviously the first thing was to build the community. The second thing was to reward and get to this there's all nuances in a short while. Um, but we doubled their online revenue. Uh, because what was happening was the people who were on their Facebook page and following them on Twitter had not actually used the website to purchase. The thing with exclusive books and the, the kind of hurdle was that we wanted the community to use the actual website to start buying. And they weren't doing it. They didn't see it as like a kind of or something like that or a natural competitor. Um, but now they were incentivized to go and try the website because, you know, to get a 200 grand book for 10 bucks is a pretty much a no-brainer. That's sort of a fairly easy, um, a fairly easy process, so they started buying other books. And that was just, that was actually quite unexpected for us, to be quite honest. But it, it doubled their revenue in one month. And that was actual natural sales of other books that they saw that were on the website. So just moving on swiftly, in terms of the lessons that we can, um, we can learn from these examples and obviously from the Grateful Dead, who I'm scientific, I'm very fan of. Um, the first is, and, and this is something that I can't, I, I can't actually overstate the importance of, is in terms of creating a sustainable community, have a cause. And this is different to, um, a grand message or you know what the promise is or whatever and it's, it can sometimes get confused in terms of coming up with the strategy and the creative and all that kind of stuff. In terms of creating a sustainable community management campaign, you need to have, you need to understand as marketers what is the cause of the campaign. Um, an example would be um, the Grateful Dead for example. Their cause was this idea of real music, as opposed to you know as music was evolving and becoming more and more poppy and um, and, and people experimenting all these other things. The Grateful Dead really you know evangelized to their fans that they are going to show them how music really should be played. And as I've gotten to know this band in the past couple of months that I've been researching all the stuff, I've realized that these guys are seriously seriously talented musicians. They really, really knew their stuff. But the other thing is, they would create this, this experience. So their thing is, the one the drummer said in, in some interview in a book, um, 
we're not in the music business, we're in the transportation business. We're going to transport you from wherever you are into some like some other place. <laughs> like it's kind of fueled by the, the least of the pharmaceutical material. But, um, but that was their cause. You know, they, they regaled against the, the disco and, and obviously later the whole sort of new romantic and metallic thing. So for, for 30 years, they stuck to their guns and they really kind of rewarded their community for sticking to their belief in this cause. Um, in a sort of more uh, kind of commercial sense, with exclusive books, for example, we identified the cause, um, and to be quite honest, retrospectively, because it was uh, it wasn't our intention for the, com the campaign to do as well as it did. But the cause was about escapism. It wasn't like the whole brand, like the love of books or whatever it is, because people weren't entering the competition because they love books. They're entering the competition because they just wanted to escape, and that's what we tapped into. And I think that's what you need to tap into for a community building campaign. Um, the second is give content freely. Something that the Grateful Dead did, um, which I think is fascinating, is that they encouraged their, the Dead Heads to tape, to record their concerts. Now, if you consider, you know, if you go to a Rolling Stones uh, concert and you try and bring out your camera and you, you take a little video, like you're going to get some big ass guy haul you out there and probably beat the crap out of you outside because you're just not allowed to do that stuff. It's basically bootlegging. But they, they said explicitly, take our stuff, share it. Because for them, they knew that it was about marketing. It was about spreading the word, introducing new people to the Grateful Dead, and obviously, you know, um, espousing this cause. So giving content, they were kind of doing Napster before Napster, you know, before the whole sort of social media revolution of music sharing and so on and so forth. Um, Something that's just, I think, quite interesting is create unique idiosyncrasies. idiosyncrasies. Um, I, when I was doing the research on Grateful Dead, I saw these guys all over the place, and I was wondering what the hell are these dancing bears doing in all the kind of Grateful Dead like liner notes and all that kind of stuff. And it turns out that this bear is like this iconic thing that Dead Heads just like aspire to you own. <laughs> they all have like, posters and they've got friggin' pajamas and weird ass stuff. But this dancing bear is some like acid influenced uh, sketch that the drummer did on the back of one of their albums. And it's just kind of took off from there. God knows why it's become so huge in their culture, but it is. And everyone understands who is a bear head why this is so important. And anyway, so these bears are freaking everywhere. Um, uh, we have a joke in our studio like, whatever presentation we do, we slip in a, a beer of armor slide. Um, because, you know, Obama did social media so well. This is Barack Obama. Um, and he basically is a dead head. He's a huge fan of the Grateful Dead. In fact, he had um, the Grateful Dead play at the inauguration. Um, and, and he had all these, like, acid-taking, acid uh, weed-smoking dudes in his audience. Maybe it explains a lot. But, um, but, yeah, the thing is about what we've noticed is to activate a campaign. In the lead up to this activation process, try and identify those who've got the most sway. I mean, that's a that's kind of obvious street. Um, and I think you'll always find that there are the other guys who are willing to take the cause, who understand the cause, and willing to evangelize for you. Martin Gladwell talks a lot about it at the tipping point, and it's obviously a marketing statement. Um, this is obviously really important as well. With social media, we've got the ability to, and with these new tools of digital, you've got the ability to empower clients. So create things like forums. Allow them to engage with each other. Remember the holy grail of community marketing? is all about getting them to talk with each other. So what the Grateful Dead have done really well is create these forums and literally, I mean, they just span for miles and miles and miles. People talking about like what's their best um, like marijuana cake that they ever had at a, at a Grateful Dead concert. You know, that kind of stuff just, I don't know, entertains them. So this is what they talk about. But no money really has been spent in the kind of activation of those conversations. They just happen naturally and they keep on going. Um, and then uh, I'm coming to the close now, by the way, just in case you're starting to run off. Um, the, the sixth lesson, um, also absolutely key, is interact relentlessly. We've noticed this going back to that Rosendahl campaign. One of the little nuances that we realized that he was doing um, in, in getting to over 100,000 people on his Facebook page 
was that every single person who entered, they would say like, hi, oh, like I really want to win this two night holiday away in Robertson. Um, Gear himself, or his wife, or his, his niece, or secretary, or whatever, would go and say, gee, thanks for entering, so cool to have you on board. And, and just started fueling. The other thing, just this, like a little sub, uh, sub note to this, is what they were doing was just providing rewards often. So if someone said, I've just invited my whole database of friends to, to, to enter this competition, you'd say, thanks so much, here's a bottle of wine, or here's a, a case of wine, or here's a little Rosendale t-shirt, or whatever. He was just doing this naturally, and this guy's not even a friggin' marketer. But he knew that interacting relentlessly was absolutely key. Part of that is to reward this. Um, the Grateful Dead just did so many concerts. They literally get to know the fans by doing just an unbelievable workload. 2,300 shows over a 25 to 29 year span. It's just absolutely crazy. So they've toured more than any other rock and roll band in history. Home's easy top I found that out the other day. Um, so the question is, is community building really all that important? I believe it is. And I'd love to know whether or not you guys think it is, but I think it is the most important thing for marketers to understand in the future. All this gathering amounts of noise, increasing distraction levels, and the changing behaviors of our target market, the fact that, you know, with the attention economy or whatever, people just die by it. But um, the, the fact is, you have got this, this real seismic shift in that people are becoming better at filtering out the stuff that's just not relevant to them or resonant to them. Um, and the other thing that's happening is that we are adopting filtering tools. And I mean, that's everywhere. I mean, if you think just even on TV, you look at, um, at PBR and all that kind of stuff. Even Gmail, for example. I use Gmail because it's just got such a good spam filtering technique. It's, it filters out all the stuff that I don't, I, like, you know, you know, just for a laugh, I'll go into my spam folder and like in a day, I've got 2,000 emails from Nigerians mostly, and you know, <laughs> so um, the point being is I believe that it's really important. And uh, this photo, by the way, like I don't know, if, does, does anyone recognize where this is from? This is uh, the launch iPad. Yeah. Yeah. This is from the iPad. They were sleeping outside, like <laughs> I don't know, like I mean, I'm pretty sure you could walk into a store like in the day and buy it, but anyway, that's quite important. Yeah. <laughs> Like, a year later, we find it here. <laughs> it's going to be launching for 5,000 rounds. Oh, really? 16 gig Wi-Fi. Okay, so I, can, I can point to life with all the guys in my studio. It would be like 12 grand. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the point is that um, you know, there's obviously some some guys who've understood this for quite some time. Apple being one of them, and there's a lot of brands that are doing it right. Um, and I thought this stat was pretty cool in terms of. Um, when people have chosen to opt in to a community, they're nine times more likely to buy a product from that community than from a competing, uh, competing brand. And that's quite significant if you think about it. Um, looking again at the great Dead, 46 years later, now bearing in mind Jerry Garcia, the guy that you know, did all those drugs, he died 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, of a drug related heart attack, by the way. Um, they disbanded five months later. But now this is now 16 years later since he's died. They've got 800,000 fans of, uh, on Facebook, pretty much value in China. They're still doing $60 million of merchandise per annum. And this is from a bunch of guys who are probably sitting on a beach in Bali somewhere, sipping in the cocktails, and not doing a heck of a lot because their community is doing everything for them. They've got over 100 licensees, people like from Neiman Marcus, like the biggest chains in the United States, selling their tie-dye things in those freaking weird-ass beds. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's just phenomenal how this gathering momentum has come out of just this religious uh, focus on a, on a visceral, emotive cause that touched, obviously, a hell of a lot of people. Um, I mean, this is just crazy. The, the Grateful Dead bean bear, like this little black bean toy is the second most high, uh, 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 second highest selling um, uh, bean bag toy after the bean bags, whatever that is. <laughs> so this is now 46 years later in terms of this community, 16 years after the band disbanded. So clearly 
there is a, a very strong argument for community building. And if you think about it, I mean, it obviously stands to good measure. You look at some of the brands, like Harley Davidson, for example. Some of my mates are, um, are big time motorbike fanatics, and we touch on Davidson because they say it's crap. You know, the actual quality is crap. Although apparently it's improved. But the point is, it's just ridden all those waves um, to come to a point where um, the community just keeps on rolling and gathering momentum. And that's it.